Good morning everyone and welcome to the presentation of ASA Bloy's third interim report in 2024. My name is Björn Tebell, I'm heading Investor Relations and joining me here in the studio are ASA Bloy's CEO Nico Delvaux and our CFO Erik Pider. As usual we will now start this conference with a summary of the report before we open up for your questions. So with that over to you Nico. Thank you Björn and also good morning from my side. Q2, Q3 results, we can report good results. We went back to positive organic uh, growth in Q3. I would say small positive organic growth of only 0.3%, uh, percent, but then also this quarter complemented in a good way to strong growth uh, through acquisitions of plus 4%. Uh, percent. And then very strong execution with uh, an EBIT of 6.3 billion SEC, record uh, high level and an EBIT margin of 16.7%, the highest uh, for a Q3 since uh, seven years. And also good uh, execution on the, on the balance sheet side, working capital side, with an excellent cash conversion of 118%. Uh, we continue also uh, our high acquisition pace with seven acquisitions completed in the quarter, uh, 18 uh, in the first uh, nine months. If you look in the numbers, a sales of uh, 37.5 billion SEC, 1% uh, up, 5% up currency adjusted. Like I mentioned, the a very small positive organic growth, 4% uh, uh, net acquired, and then minus 3% on the currency, that's mainly SEC versus dollar. Um, we also want to emphasize the EBITDA margin <coughs> of 17.7%. That's a record high number since we started uh, reporting EBITDA margin. And as the, the gap between EBIT and EBITDA margin becomes bigger, you see it's now 1%. We also want to emphasize a bit more the EBITDA uh, number as we want to make sure that yeah, you also can compare us with, with other uh, uh, people on the market uh, in a similar way. Um, our EBIT margin, like I mentioned, is 16.7%, uh, uh, the highest uh, uh, number in for the last uh, uh, seven years for uh, Q3. A bit of 6.3 billion sec, 8% up, earnings per share 10% up. If you look a little bit at the, at the different regions, and perhaps I, I comment uh, first a bit on the different segments, I would say Q3 has been very similar as Q1 and Q2 in the sense that non-residential in our three main markets in North America, in Europe and in, in, in Oceania, uh, market conditions continue to be healthy on a good uh, level in all three regions, whereas residential market in all three regions continue to be challenging. And like we mentioned earlier, we are still convinced that uh, North America is uh, further down in the cycle, in the sense that in North America, new built residential has uh, turned, and R&R at least has uh, bottomed out, where uh, Europe then in that cycle is much uh, later in the cycle. Uh, if you look at different verticals, an important vertical for us uh, in entrance systems is the logistic uh, vertical, where we continue to see also challenging market conditions as well in North America as in, in Europe. Um, if you look at the different regions, organic growth of plus 1% in, in North uh, America. Again, different picture, uh, good uh, development on the commercial side, a flat development on the uh, residential side and then challenging uh, conditions on the logistic vertical. A flat uh, uh, South America, that's mainly because of a difficult comparison for HID uh, compared to the same quarter uh, a year ago. Plus two in Europe, plus 13 in Africa, and then minus five in uh, Oceania, and minus eight in uh, Asia, where we have uh, seen market conditions further deteriorating in, in Greater China. We have also seen some spillover of that uh, negative market condition into Southeast uh, Asia. We have seen uh, the government in China making some uh, uh, extra measures to uh, help uh, the construction uh, market. Also some uh, positive numbers on, on new housing, uh, houses being sold uh, coming out uh, this morning. But we believe that in general, uh, uh, those uh, measures are still uh, yeah, moderate and it will take some time before we see market in China uh, recover. 
So market highlights, uh, I will not go through all the project wins, but if I take uh, a couple of them, uh, we were also present at the Olympic uh, Games. We were able to sell 30,000 log handles and cylinders for the Olympic uh, Village in Paris. And then we were able to sell uh, dock levers and doors to the Europea European's largest uh, logistic center. Product launches, let me also only pick one here. Quickset Unite, mobile-enabled uh, wireless smart uh, lock for multifamily uh, properties. Let's say the first uh, new product family that we launched now since we uh, acquired uh, Quickset. Very excited uh, about that uh, product range. And then on the award uh, side, if I also pick one there, uh, good to see that also our uh, branding, marketing activities uh, pay off. A blow in Finland and Fichet in France were uh, voted as the most value, valued brand in their markets. If you see that uh, Abloy in, in Finland is overall seen as the, the strongest uh, brand in that country, something we can be really uh, very proud of. Um, so the quarter, again, uh, slight positive organic growth, complemented uh, with good growth to um, acquisitions. Our sales now 46% up on a 12-month moving trend versus uh, 2019. A good uh, improvement of the operating margin with the run rate, 12 month run rate now uh, at 15.9%, so very close uh, to the band which we aim for. And an EBITDA margin of 16.8% uh, on a 12 month moving uh, uh, trend. So, a uh, better top line, improved margin, therefore accelerated operating profit, record operating profit in the quarter. Uh, and run rate of habit up 61% versus uh, five years ago. We continue to be very active on the acquisition side, with uh, seven acquisitions completed in Q3, 18 acquisitions in the first nine months of the year. Those acquisitions represent an annualized sales of uh, around 7 billion sec. And then you might have uh, read a couple of days ago that we also uh, are divesting our citizen ID business, our passport business, you could say in HID. Uh, that uh, transaction is expected to close somewhere in Q1 next year. And uh, that business represents an annualized sales of around 1.3 billion uh, sec. Some highlights on the acquisitions. Levelock, excited about this technology uh, acquisition. Um, will be um, integrated in the Americas uh, uh, division and we will run it as a a technology uh, hub for uh, connected uh, uh, wireless uh, uh, locks. They uh, had a sales of 170 uh, million sec uh, last year. They will be dilutive to PS uh, from uh, the start. And then the bigger acquisition, Ski Data, um, an Austrian uh, provider of access management solutions for uh, parkings, for uh, ski resorts and for concert halls and uh, you know, um, uh, stadiums and, and so on. They had a sales of uh, 3.5 billion sec uh, last year, and they will also have a small dilutive effect to EPS as from uh, the start. They will be integrated into entrance systems into the pedestrian uh, segment. If we then go into the different divisions, starting with uh, opening solutions in MEA, positive organic sales of plus 1%, good growth in Central Europe, uh, a good growth also in the Nordics against uh, an easy comparison last year, I would say. Stable sales in South Europe, but then sales decline in Middle East, India, Africa, and also in UK and Ireland. Strong execution with a good operating margin of 14.5%, uh, with good operating leverage, helped by currency 50 base points because of the stronger SEC, and then also helped by M&A accretive 20 base points. Americas, another very strong quarter with an organic sales increase of uh, 4%. Very strong sales growth in Latin. Strong sales growth also in North America, non-residential. And then a stable sales in our North America residential business, you could say the HHI uh, business. Very strong operating margin of 19.2%. Uh, with a very good operating leverage, 80 base points accretive. Good price cost. Uh, good margin improvement in general and, and definitely also a continued margin improvement in our North America residential uh, business where again we have seen an uh, improvement versus previous quarter and an improvement also versus the same quarter 
a year ago. And we are confident that that trend will continue as synergies continue to kick in. FX has been dilute with 10 base points and M&A 160 base points accretive that has to do with you know, all the uh, costs that we booked for HHI um, a year ago. So in, in, in the bridge, it gives us a you know, one time you could say positive effect of 200, uh, 205 million uh, sec year uh, over year. I think more, more important underlying uh, uh, the HHI business had a stable top line development and an improved uh, bottom line. Opening solutions uh, Asia Pacific, organic sales decline of 6%. We've only stable sales in South Korea and negative uh, uh, sales growth in, in the rest of the uh, division. Well, like I mentioned earlier, uh, market conditions in, in China further declining. Despite the stronger organic uh, negative sales uh, evolution, good operating margin of 7.9%, where uh, we only had a smaller dilution because of the negative volume, because we were able to offset that to a big extent, I would say, to efficiency improvements. And then EVIX stable, and we didn't do any M&A in this uh, division. Global tech, organic sales uh, back to positive plus 2%. Um, where in HID, uh, now the, the whole story of the, the backlog we build up and then invoicing on, on the backlog of uh, packs, cards and readers is over since September. September was the first, I would say, normal month uh, again for uh, uh, packs. Uh, and, uh, and therefore, uh, we have seen also, again, uh, a growth of that uh, uh, business area in HID. Also very strong sales growth in global uh, solutions. And uh, I would say strong operating margin of 18.9% uh, with very good operating leverage, 110 base points. Driven by efficiency measures, but also a positive mix where we get, uh, again, more uh, relative sales of packs, which is a more profitable part of the, of the business in, in global tech. FX and M&A dilutive, uh, 30 base points and 40 base points, respectively. And then last but not least, entrance systems, an organic sales decline of 2%. <coughs> and we have since good sales growth in pedestrian uh, and, in, and in parameter security. But then sales decline in residential. Residential is for us mainly a North American uh, business. And there, you know, the, st the story I told about the residential market. And on the industrial side, very exposed to that uh, logistic uh, vertical where the loading dog business uh, uh, continues to be uh, yeah, challenging. Good to see that our service growth continues in line with our ambition to uh, grow high single uh, digit. Strong operating margin of 17.1%. Definitely if take into account that we acquired ski data in this quarter and had a rather higher uh, acquisition related uh, costs for ski data that uh, yeah, gave uh, a dilution of 110 base points. FX up 10 base points, but then very strong operating leverage and 10 base points, uh, very good uh, price cost realization and then also uh, a positive uh, uh, mix. And with that, I give the word to Eric our CFO to give some more details on the financial numbers, Eric. Thank you, Nico, and also a very good morning from my side. As you heard from Nico, we now uh, turned, so we actually had a positive organic growth in the quarter, a small one, but still it was positive. And in total, the sales uh, increased with 1%. Of course, we like also to mention that we had some records, like for instance, that we had in EBIT value, the 6.3 billion sec, uh, it, it's a record for, for Q3 and it's up with 8% versus the same period last year. We also had a record EBITDA margin of 17.7. It's up with a point. And we had the best EBIT margin for a Q3 quarter since uh, 2017. It ended on 16.7. We had slightly less impacts on the interest rates. We also sort of you, uh, we also sort of see a bit, of course, interest rates slightly going down. So income before tax is up with 10%. It's the same with the net income as well as with the EPS versus the same period last year. Operating cash flow is lower than what it was sort of a quarter ago. But remember that we had a very strong operating cash flow in Q2, Q3 and Q4 last year. But if you compare the 6.3 then historically and with a cash conversion of 180 18%, 
it's still it still is very strong. And it's also good to see that uh, return on capital employed improved sequentially with 20 base points and ended the quarter at 14.2. If we dissect a bit and go a bit to the bridge, um, if you look on the organic part, price is a strong one, which consequently means that volume is uh, negative with about 1%. The flow through, as you can see, is very strong and helps the result with, with 90 base points. This comes from strong price realization. We had lower material cost. We had MFP savings of roughly 130 million sec in the quarter, as well as good cost control. Slight negative impact on the currency, uh, where, of course, we see that the weakening of the dollar. M&A looks a bit strange this quarter. Nico mentioned it before. The main reason is, let's say, the mechanism of the bridge, where we sort of had integration cost and cost related to the HHI acquisition a year ago, which was negative. And then, let's say, this year it turns positive, just purely, let's say, due to how the bridge works. If, however, as you, you have seen that we have seen before that we have done some acquisitions, which in reality have a dilutive uh, impact in the acquisition column, ski data, as well as level lock. Going forward, um, ski data is estimated <coughs> to have on, on group a negative dilutive impact of 40 base points and on entrance system consequently roughly 120 base points. We had a good <coughs> momentum still on direct material, the price versus cost. The mix in total is 240 base points. Roughly 100 base points of that comes from a mix with the stronger global technologies, weaker APAC, as well as the interdivisional mix, where you heard Nico mention before regarding that service was stronger than equipment in um, entrance, which sort of helps from a, a mix perspective. However, if you look sort of the total, then roughly 140 base points is, if I call it the true, price versus cost. So we still have a, a strong tailwind. We, uh, we sort of we see that we're also going to have a tailwind also for Q4 as well as for Q1. It, they're going to sort of go down slightly, but that is sort of the estimate that we do today. Conversion cost is impacted by uh, inflation and higher wage cost. It's down with 130 base points. Sequentially, then, if you look on SGNA. Uh, it is sort of better than what it was in Q2. In Q2, we had roughly a negative impact of 80 base points, whereas then, as you can see uh, in this quarter, it was 30 base points. So we can see sort of despite that we continue to invest in R&D as well as continue to invest in sales, we, have, we are sort of still finding efficiency measures in order to, let's say, reduce the impact that we have there. I mentioned before uh, the cash flow of 6.3, uh, cash conversion of 118 percent in in the quarter. We still sort of see that okay, we had sort of a good EBITDA flow value, as but we continue to sort of see that working capital is going down, which is good, let's say, for our cash flow position. That sort of leaves that we on the gearing the net debt to EBITDA is now at 2.3. And despite that we have been rather active, I would say, on acquisition front, we were able to reduce our net debt in total with 1.3 billion sec. Yes, we had some help from the currency, but we also sort of could see that the strong cash flow, were, we were able then to sort of to be able to, uh, to sort of do the acquisition payments that we have done, which means that you know, at the end of the day, we have sort of still a very strong balance sheet and financial position, so we can continue with our acquisition strategy also going forward. Last slide from me is the EPS, which I mentioned before, is up with 10% versus the same period a year ago. And with that, I hand it back to Nico for some concluding remarks. Thanks, Eric. So um, uh, Q3, a quarter where we went back to positive organic growth, slight positive organic growth. But if you look at total, a currency adjusted sales growth of uh, plus 5%. Uh, the very strong execution with a record operating income, 6.3 billion sec, and also very strong EBITDA and EBIT uh, margin. Excellent cash conversion of 118%. Uh, percent. It's clear that we continue to operate in an uncertain economic climate. We are definitely on the residential side, market conditions remain challenging. 
Therefore, we continue with, with our approach, like in previous quarters, to take advantage of the opportunities that we see in the market. We will continue to invest there where we see that there is potential to, to grow. But then in those markets or in those segments where we see that market conditions are more challenging, we, of course, will adapt cost, uh, protect bottom line and cash flow. Therefore, we will remain agile through our decentralized organization and make sure that we uh, continue to realize uh, efficiencies. It's clear that the lower interest rate trend that has now started, at least in North America and in Europe, will help us uh, uh, over uh, uh, time. And, 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 and over time, we will then see also the residential market uh, coming back. And with that, I give the word back to Bjorn for uh, Q&A. Thank you, Nico. Well, this means that we are ready to open up for questions. And uh, can I please just remind you to limit yourself to one question each and, and a follow-up. And if we go through the whole list, then you can obviously uh, indicate that you would like to ask another question. Operator, this means that we are ready to uh, kick off the Q&A session. Please go ahead. We will now begin the question and answer session. Anyone who wishes to ask a question may press star and one on their touch tone telephone. You will hear a tone to confirm that you have entered the queue. If you wish to remove yourself from the question queue, you may press star and two. Participants are requested to use only handsets while asking a question. Anyone who has a question may press star and one at this time. The first question is from Daniela Costa from Goldman Sachs. Please go ahead. Hi, good morning. Thanks for taking my question. I will take the, the question and the follow-up opportunity. But uh, starting with the question, I was wondering if you can comment like you normally do on the start of the existing quarter and whether we, you see any signs of those potential recoveries that you mentioned on your um, kind of outlook statement in, in, in the second page of the, of the press release. I guess you're after the, the exit run rate and then the run rate in, in, in October. Um, if you look at the quarter, obviously it's a little bit difficult to talk about the run rate because July and August are holiday months. It's always very difficult to, to judge then the holiday um, months in the sense that Q3 is mainly made in, in September. So it's difficult to, com uh, to comment on September versus July, August. But if you look at September and October, you can say that run rates, if you correct for working days, are are similar. So go, going into October, we haven't seen up or down. It's a similar run rate as September. Mm -hmm. Got it. Thank you. Um, and then a second question is just regarding just, uh, can you give us a little bit of context of like what prompted the citizen ID um, divestment and, and whether sort of you're more actively looking at, at, at parts of the portfolio or was that just like a, a complete one-off thing? Yeah, as, you, as, as you know, we, we constantly look at our portfolio and from time to time uh, we, we decided that something does not fit in our uh, portfolio. I think if you, if you look at the time that I'm here since 2018, I think we did uh, four or five uh, smaller uh, uh, divestments. So we are clearly a, a net uh, acquirer. And the reason now to uh, divest Citizen ID is that we have, uh, we have the, always the ambition to be the number one or... Uh, at least the number two in the market. With Citizen ID, we were, you could say, a far number three. We were definitely not the number one or the number two. They were much stronger uh, than us. It's very different to play a game where you are a market leader versus where you are uh, a follower. We have also seen that the market leaders in this uh, segment uh, at best make uh, high single-digit uh, EBIT uh, margins. So very different, difficult for us to to realize the financial ambitions we, we have as a group uh, and having uh, you know, businesses within that 16 to 17 percent EBIT uh, bracket. That's one thing. The, the second thing, uh, from a sales uh, dynamic perspective, this is also very different from what we, we do in the rest of uh, the group in the sense that these are much, much more long project-based uh, sales uh, cycles where you, uh, when, when, when a country decides to do a passport business, you you will uh, engage with that uh, country for two, three years. Um, then an RFQ comes comes out, and then um, uh, when you uh, when you uh, uh, get that RFQ at the beginning, it will be uh, a cash uh, negative uh, uh, project. And then over time, over the 10 years or the 15 years that you have the project, then slowly you will then uh, uh, start to uh, uh, make better margins. So it's a very Lumpy off and off, on and off uh, uh, project uh, business, which is very different from what we 
we are used to in the in the group. So I would say that is the, the two main reasons why uh, we decided to divest uh, the citizen ID business. Where you know uh, definitely after uh, COVID, um, the the weaknesses of that uh, uh, segment became more um, obvious. I would say that we had done a very good job in in bringing the profit uh, from high double digit uh, losses back to positive, but uh, uh, we didn't s we didn't see. Uh, a way to get to that 16, 70 percent. That was the main reason. Okay, thank you. The next question is from Andre Kuchin from UBS. Please go ahead. Uh, good morning. Thank you very much for taking my question. I'll ask that first and then see if I have a follow up. Um, just at this time of the year, we usually try to think about 2025 or the following year. Um, as uh, some of the indicators start coming out. I just wondered if you could share your thoughts, uh, any color on how you think your major and markets will evolve um, across uh, Europe and uh, North America uh, in 2025. We all think about next year, then it's you know, thinking and, and having a good idea is something else. I think it's still uh, very difficult. Uh, and uh, like I also mentioned earlier, I think we are still working in a very... Um, fragile and definitely def uh, dynamic market uh, environment. You have from one side the political or, um, uh, risks with all the conflicts going on uh, in, in the world and we don't know in which direction they will go. We have important uh, elections that have taken place and will take uh, place uh, soon where the outcome is still uh, uh, uncertain. So these are a lot of uh, moving parameters that can you know, uh, change direction in, in, in a positive or in a negative uh, way. I think what, what, what definitely will happen is that we will continue to live in a higher inflationary world uh, now after COVID, also next year than prior to uh, COVID, which means, like I we always said, that uh, you know, we live in a market where we can push through inflation through price increases in the market. Uh, so that, that uh, you know, should be, be a positive uh, effect. I think there is also consensus that interest rates will uh, further uh, go down. Uh, as well in Europe uh, as in, uh, as in uh, North America, and, and hopefully they are confident that they will start to reduce interest rates also in Australia, um, which over time should give us a, a positive uh, effect. With that footnote, if you take, for instance, the US, uh, and as most people have a loan on their house, uh, the, the people that have a, house on their uh, a loan on their house sorry, have an interest rate uh, at around 5%. So we need some more interest uh, rate cuts to come to that 5% uh, level to really start uh, moving things in, in uh, North America so that you know, people really start to sell and, move and buy new, new houses. But uh, ultimately, that, that will uh, come. I think you will see first positive effects uh, on the more retail-related uh, business and then later on the R&R side. And like I said, I think we will see first an upturn in the US and then uh, later uh, in Europe. HID will also be back to a more normalized uh, 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 business where the whole PAX uh, story is behind us now as of uh, uh, September. And in that aspect, and also next year should be a more, you could say, normal year uh, uh, for uh, HID. But so like I said, a lot of uh, you know, uh, moving parameters and, and perhaps too early to really uh, have a good view on, on what's going to happen next year. Thank you. Thank you, Nico. And if I may just use the follow-up to ask about ski data now that you've uh, closed the deal and had a, a chance to look under the hood. Uh, could you comment on how quickly you can get the margins up in that business towards what uh, you see acceptable for us around that 15 16% and whether uh, now that you've seen more inside the company, how, how that turned out to be versus the original assessment? I would say uh, timeframes are very similar to what we, we said for uh, HHI. But I think we have a first uh, plan to come to double uh, digit, and I think that we, sh we, we, we should be able to do in the, in the first three uh, years. Uh, and then you know, from there, we will then uh, further move and see how, how high we, we, we get. So a bit of different um, acquisition than many of the others in the sense that uh, uh, out uh, today, it's a business of around 300 million euro, but they make very low single digit uh, uh, EBIT margin uh, uh, today. Uh, whereas normally our acquisitions have a little bit uh, higher um, EBIT margin. So a lot of the, the payback will indeed come from that uh, uh, improved uh, EBIT margin from 
uh, very low single digit in the first place to uh, double digit. Thank you. The next question is from Mida Vivek from CT. Please go ahead. Thanks very much, everyone, and good morning. Uh, following up from uh, Andre's question, would you mind commenting on the latest trends in the specification activity by region? Thank you. Yeah. So if you look on um, group level, specification is up uh, mid to higher uh, single uh, digit. If you uh, look at the two main uh, regions, uh, in the uh, US it's uh, uh, low to mid single digit uh, negative uh, in the quarter. Um, there's a bit details. Uh, we have the, the, the normal suspects that are negative uh, multifamily uh, offices. We have the, the normal suspects that are uh, strongly positive uh, education, K-12, uh, data centers, although a lot of business for data centers also doesn't go through the normal specification channel. I think the big deviation uh, this quarter and also previous quarter has been on the healthcare uh, side where we saw negative uh, development. And, and we still believe that is a, a timing uh, issue because we don't see any reason why uh, healthcare would, uh, would slow down. In Europe, uh, we have seen a, a high uh, single digit uh, uh, growth and we have seen a continued uh, positive trend for shift from mechanical to electromechanical and good uh, development on the sustainability type of uh, spec business. Thank you very much. The next question is from Alexander Vergo from Bank of America. Please go ahead. Uh, yeah, morning, Nico. Thanks for taking the question. I wondered if you could talk a little bit about um, <clears throat> HHI for us. Obviously, that's now in the organic growth. I'm just wondering if you could give us a sense of what that uh, growth is in HHI versus the uh, underlying growth uh, in, in the Americas, particularly given the uh, the drag that resi markets are having on entrance systems uh, in the US. Uh, that That's the first question. And then as a follow-up, I wondered, Eric, if you could just comment a little bit on the regional differences in pricing dynamics um, uh, and the fact that uh, things have slowed a little bit, as you would, you, you'd indicated they would. I uh, just wondered if you could give us a sense of, of uh, pricing dynamics in the market now and, and, and thinking, you know, I guess, back to Andre's question around uh, exit rates into 25. Thank you. I think on, on, on top line, uh, HHI was uh, flat uh, compared to the uh, same quarter uh, a year uh, ago. Um, when it comes to uh, pricing, uh, Eric mentioned a, a strong one, so it's, you could say it's closer to 1.5%. Uh, uh, um, Region-wise, there is not so much uh, difference. It's perhaps more material-based uh, uh, related. Where I said the same thing in Q1 and Q2, two on, on st everything what is steel related, so steel doors, fencing business, uh, loading docks, we are happy that we can keep uh, the prices. So there we, we don't see the possibility short term to further increase uh, prices. Although with that footnote that steel has been uh, stabilizing now uh, and um, definitely uh, uh, going into next year, we will look into possibilities and to again increase uh, prices there. But for time being, everything what is steel related is, is flat. Uh, all the rest, we continue to increase prices, and we also will uh, now continue to increase prices uh, beginning uh, next year when it's copper, zinc, um, aluminium, um, uh, you name it, because we also continue to see general inflation, electricity, energy inflation, um, logistic inflation, definitely labor uh, inflation, which is high this year and will continue to be high also uh, uh, next year. So it's not so much uh, region. The only exception is perhaps China, where... It's very difficult uh, to increase uh, prices. And also the Hawaii channel, where it's difficult to increase prices. In the Hawaii channel, you, you indirectly increase prices more through new product uh, launches and uh, new product uh, development. So you would think more of the, the divisions that are more steel related. So entrance systems and Americas, they have the lower uh, price component and the others have a, have a higher price component. That's super helpful. Thank you. The next question is from Gail Debray from uh, Deutsche Bank. Please go ahead. Oh, uh, good morning. Thanks very much for taking my questions. Uh, so 
so so maybe just to follow up on the uh, on the the question that was just asked about pricing. So do, do you still expect pricing to be at least two uh, percent for the full year? Um, and then the second question is uh, about global tech, which obviously had a, a very strong performance uh, this quarter, margin wise. Um, so do you still see global tech as a 17 to 18 percent margin business on a normalized basis? Or, or is there perhaps now a bit of upside uh, following the strong Q3 performance and, and the divestment of citizen ID? Um, yes, on the on the pricing, yes, we will be more than 2% for the full year because, again, you will remember in Q1 we said that the price component was 2%, but we said a strong 2%, so 2.5% uh, you could say in Q1. On Q2 it was a, a strong 2%, between 2 and 2.5%. Two and now we said it's a strong 1, so 1.5%. One so we don't need that much price increase, you could say, now in Q4 to realize the, the, the minimum uh, 2%. So yes, we are confident that we'll get uh, the 2% uh, this year. Uh, the, one, the one or the 1.5% in Q3 is more because of the comparison with, uh, with last year. So that's on the, on the pricing uh, side. Uh, the other question was? Global tech and margin. Oh yeah, global tech and, and margin. Yes, we still uh, want to hold on the you know, 17 to 18% uh, uh, margin. It's true that Q3 was was high and higher than that uh, 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 ambition, but you should not forget that it's very seasonal. Q3 is always a good uh, quarter for global tech. And we had now uh, in, in, in Q3 also a bit that positive mix where you know, PAX as of September uh, came, uh, uh, came uh, back. So that citizen ID will help us, uh, I would say marginally on uh, uh, the margin. Uh, for uh, uh, global tech, uh, around 10 base points. Um, but we, it's also true that we continue to invest heavily in our uh, different verticals in global um, uh, solutions, where we continue to see high double-digit uh, growth and where we want to bring them to a higher uh, critical um, volume. The uh, same is true for some of the other business areas in HID, where we continue to invest. So that 70 to 18 percent EBIT margin remains our uh, ambition for global tech going forward, yes. Thank you very much. The next question is from Matthias Holmberg from DNB. Please go ahead. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm going to stick a little bit to global tech regarding the margins. Uh, as, as you point towards the, the improvement not coming until September in the PAX business, and I hear your sort of mentioning here of, of the seasonality, but I'm just curious to hear if we in Q4 get the full benefit of the PAX recovery, would not that imply that you should get a, an even larger support from, from the PAX business going forward? Yeah, that is true. Then, of course, there is a lot of other um, uh, moving parameters in, in, in global tech. You should say global tech is around 70%, HID is around 30%. Uh, global uh, global solutions, and in in HID, forty five percent around is is PAX, which is the most profitable part of uh, HID. In global solutions, we have hospitality, which is also around forty five percent, and which is the more profitable part of of global solutions. So, depending on the mix, how much hospitality you have in global solutions versus the rest, or in in PAX or, or in HID, how much PAX you have versus the rest affects the the margin in a in an important uh, way because all the other business areas have still lower margin, but we are investing in those uh, other business areas to you know uh, make them uh, grow faster than uh, packs or uh, and definitely also make them grow faster than than hospitality. And if we succeed in that, that of course gives them a negative mix overall. Understood. So just to be clear, if if you'd had the full benefit in in the entire quarter of Q3 from the PAX recovery, the margin would have been even higher, what is equal. Yes, that's correct, yes. Thank you. The next question is from James Moore from Redburn Atlantic. Please go ahead. Yeah, morning, everyone. I've got a couple, if I could. Um, I wanted to talk about Europe and the EMEA margin. It's a bit below where it sort of was for some time, and obviously Europe's been really hit by a negative construction environment. And typically and historically, you've made really great margins in Scandinavia. I'm just wondering, when you think about 
Scandinavia or Europe as a whole, kind of where are volumes now versus peak? And if we get volumes back, do you think profitability can go back where it used to be? I'm just trying to think about capacity utilization and what the path could be if we had a favorable two or three years of European construction recovery. <laughs> Uh, like we had also said on, on previous occasions, we have the ambition over time to bring EMEA to that 16% uh, EBIT uh, level. I think there's two important things for EMEA. One is, you know, the SEC, uh, you could say dilution, which uh, if you look over the years, costed us at least 150 base points. Um, it was a bit uh, positive this quarter, but, you know, if, if you look on the longer period, that, that has diluted uh, the, the result. And then the second thing is, like you said, uh, the whole uh, uh, volume uh, growth or negative uh, volume growth effect. Uh, the residential uh, segment in EMEA is around 45% uh, of EMEA. And EMEA is a strong market leader, you could say, in most uh, markets on the residential side. So if the residential market goes down uh, in a very significant way, it's very difficult for EMEA to do much better uh, than the market. So they are... Uh, uh, affected in an important uh, way by that uh, downturn of the residential market. Um, I would say for us to go back to 16% uh, uh, percent definitely what has to happen is that the residential market uh, comes back. And we are confident now that with interest rates going down uh, over time that market will uh, come back. Like I said, I think you should at least expect six to nine months between interest rate going down and us seeing that uh, in in the number. So um, as uh, MAI is later in the residential cycle, it's definitely not something that will happen in Q4 and Q1. It will be hopefully and confidently then later uh, uh, next year. And when that happens, when we get again positive uh, volume growth organically, then you will see that that, that leverage really uh, will, will kick in in an important way and therefore will improve margin further in an, impro in a, in an important way. That's very helpful. Can I follow up on die, Nico, um, the, the synergies, C could you say roughly what percentage is done and whether you now think that you can exceed the original target? Like I said, we make good, good uh, improvement. You can see that also on the, on the Americas uh, margin in the quarter, hmm? uh, where we said over time we have that ambition to go to 20% in the quarter. We were not so far uh, off. So, um, we continue to make improvements um, on the EBIT margin for HHI uh, quarter after quarter in the sense that the quarter is better than the quarter before and the quarter is better than the same quarter uh, a year ago. We are confident that we con can continue that trend as synergies continue uh, to kick in. Um, can we do better than what we said in, in initially? I would say that we, we were definitely much more confident today that we can do what we said uh, at the beginning. And we are also confident that we most probably will be able to do it faster than what we said at the beginning. Thank you very much. The next question is from Mighty Risk from Jeffries. Please go ahead. Yes, good morning. Thanks for uh, the questions. I have two and I'll take them uh, one at a time. So, Nico, maybe just on your earlier comment around uh, the residential sort of uh, rebound, and I think earlier we mentioned mortgage rates needs to reach 5%. I think that was related to the U.S. Just in your head, how are you thinking about the pace of interest rate cuts to actually see an R&R &R, um, sort of rebound in within uh, HHI business? Uh, and also, I think you talked about six to nine months. So are, are we sort of talking second part of 2025 here at the earliest? Yeah, it's perhaps a question we should ask uh, the, the president of, of the FED or the ECB. <laughs> uh, well, and perhaps you have a better view even than, than me. Uh, I can also only read what, what in the newspapers what, what people say. But I think there is consensus that interest rates uh, will, will further um, go down. And what I... I can say is that if interest rates go down, I think you see you will see the first effect in in the U.S. Just because of you know the way Americans are versus Europe Europeans, uh, if they are confident that things uh, are going to improve, they start to invest. So you will see in the U.S. Uh, in the first place retail, I think, uh, uh, coming uh, back. But then, like I said, on on R and R, the big R and R happens when people move houses. Uh, 
because you refurbish your old house because you want to sell it at a better price or you refurbish the new house that you, you bought. And for that to happen, you know, people must see that they can finance it in a similar or better way than the finance they have today. And 70%, 72% to be exact, of uh, American uh, people that have a loan on their house have an interest rate uh, at, at that 5% uh, level. So uh, for, for our R&R, really to move, for people to move houses, interest rates have to be on, on that uh, level. So it will need some more uh, interest rate uh, cuts before we see R&R really coming back. And, and depending on how fast that, that uh, goes, uh, or how slow that goes, we will fa see faster or slower recovery of the R&R uh, side for our residential business in, in the US. I think in Europe it's a bit different because we don't, uh, in the US also when you have a loan, it's easy, you, you take a loan at whatever, 4%, you can, if then six months later it's 3.5%, you can refinance in an easy way. In many markets in Europe it's a bit different because you have a fixed interest rate for a period of time and then you're yeah, stuck to that. So in Europe, perhaps you have a little bit the, the opposite. You, if people see that interest rates go, they go down, they wait a little bit longer because they hope then that the interest rate further uh, goes down. Perhaps short term, you could even say it has a negative effect and then mid term, long term, it will have a positive effect. That's also why we say that we are confident that the US is further down in the cycle than, than Europe. Uh, thanks for this. Uh, the second one is just on the uh, underlying growth within global tech. Um, you know, after this whole uh, PAC story, I think you said September was a clean month. Are we running at uh, the average sort of 5% that you're targeting for this division? So if you take PACs historically, let's say, you know, even prior to COVID to make it easy, PACs has been, uh, you could say, a diesel, <laughs> a diesel that... Uh, has has been growing on that mid single digit uh, organic uh, growth with a with a stable good high uh, margin um, and you know, we are confident um, let's see now in the months to come that 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 diesel type of uh, business will come back now that we are back in a normalized uh, situation okay thank you The next question is from Andreas Kowski from BNP Paribas. Please go ahead. Thank you, and uh, good morning. Uh, so just maybe a short-term related question, coming back to your comments about exit rates. Uh, so it sounds like October is similar to September, and I guess that means roughly flat organic growth also in October. Do you see easier comps in November and December, which should make it possible for organic growth? To clearly accelerate in Q4 versus Q3, or is it fair to assume flattish organic growth also in the fourth quarter? Thank you. As you know, we don't we don't forecast. What I can say is that if you look at uh, the the organic growth that we had in Q3 last year and and the organic growth we had in Q4 last year was very very similar. There was only 10 base points uh, uh, different. So from a comparison uh, perspective. Uh, the growth rates are, are, are very similar. Um, I think there is then some deviations. Obviously, we, we will have a clean quarter for PACs in, in HID, which uh, should, should uh, uh, help us. Um, China is, is small in the bigger picture, but China definitely has deteriorated, like I mentioned, in, in Q3, and we don't see uh, an improvement yet in, in, in Q4. And then the rest, you know, let's, let's, let's see how the markets uh, are... Uh, are evolving, but that would be the main drivers, I would say. Thank you, Nicole. And then uh, on the MMO dilution in entrance system of 110 basis points, how how much of that can be seen as sort of one loss? Because I think you had to take some yeah uh, extra costs related to the ski data acquisition in this quarter. Mm. No, we said 120 uh, uh, base points uh, okay, on entrance sorry. systems, 40 base points for uh, the group, and. I mean, you can make the calculation uh, yourself. Um, Ski data is is around uh, uh, 300 uh, million euro top line, uh, with with a bottom line last year of around let's say between three and four percent, depending a bit on on which cost you take in or not. Uh, once the PPA kicks in and we are still finalizing the the exact amount of the PPA, you will see that we are close to 
you know, close to zero. That's also why we said at the beginning uh, uh, dilutive to, to um, EPS. If you, if you take 300 uh, million top line with, let's say, 0% um, EBIT, then you can calculate yourself the dilution on entrance system and on group. Okay, so you didn't have any extra costs related to closing the acquisition in the quarter that you uh, But Andre even and further. Uh, Andreas, remember that uh, Ski Data was closed in September, which means that you only have one month of, let's say, the dilution impact that uh, Nico yeah. talks about, and then you can say the rest then would then be acquisition-related cost because it's no. I mean, it's about the same as we said. If I look, uh, as I said, on the run rate, but remember that Ski Data was only in for a month. Understood. Thank you, Eric. Thank you. Thank you, Nico. Can I just also indicate that, <clears throat> excuse me, we have one person left in the queue, so if there's anyone else who'd like to ask a question, you can please indicate that to the operator. Operator, please go ahead with, with the remaining one now. For any further questions, please press star and one. The next question is from Jonathan Day from HSBC. Please go ahead. Hi. Good morning. Thanks for taking my question. Um, it's about EMEA, and I was just wondering if you could comment a little bit more on what you're sort of seeing and expecting in the Nordics, given that um, rate cuts were perhaps a little bit earlier there, for, in particular the RICS Bank than um, the ECB. So just wondering about the timing of uh, recovery in the Nordics. Hmm. Uh, so like we said, we had uh, positive organic growth again in the Nordics. Uh, that was mainly because of uh, easier comparison compared to the same quarter a year ago, and that uh, comparison will even become easier now in, in Q4. Um, we see Sweden a bit ahead of Finland uh, as, as being the two main uh, markets uh, in Scandinavia. So we are con confident that we will continue to see perhaps a bumpy, but at least a, a gradual continued uh, recovery of uh, our business in as well Sweden as in uh, Finland, as indeed now interest rates have been cut two times in, uh, in Sweden and uh, confidently that, that trend will, uh, will uh, continue. And the first uh, cut was uh, six months ago. Yeah. So we are now in that time period that we start to see, uh, uh, we should start to see the first uh, results of that. Great. Thanks. And then maybe just a quick follow-up on the ski data deal. Could you sort of talk a little bit about more about the synergies and whether you see some more revenue or cost synergies um, from from that deal? Uh, so, uh, ski data is one of the market leaders in the field where they operate. Um, they have a high uh, recurring revenue uh, part. Um, so, as such, uh, as a company on the, on their own, we believe we must be able to do. Uh, much better margins than what they uh, have done uh, last uh, year. Also, if you comp compare with uh, colleagues of them in the market, we are confident that just standalone, uh, the margin should, uh, should in, uh, improve. And so the, the biggest return comes in the first place from margin improvement. But it's also uh, uh, an industry they operate in that where you know, the market grows around uh, that five, four or five percent. So we should be able also to realize organic growth in line with our 5% uh, uh, ambition. When it comes to synergies, we see synergies on the entrance system side uh, and on the HID side. On the entrance system side, uh, using service technicians in, in both uh, uh, directions, uh, using some of the uh, uh, products that we have in entrance systems like uh, turnstiles and so on, and then also the cost selling because uh, often I mean, if you take a, a ski resort, they also need sliding uh, uh, doors. If you, make, uh, if you take a, a parking environment, there is a lot of other uh, entrance systems uh, products that are uh, sold to that uh, uh, garage uh, uh, entity. And then definitely also on the HID side with uh, our readers, <coughs> uh, our cards, our uh, credentials, and some of the software technology uh, uh, we have. Great. Thank you very much. We have a follow-up question from Mighty Risk from Jeffries. Please go ahead. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, just a quick one on um, uh, the savings. I think you talked about MFT savings being 130 uh, million second a quarter, how we should think about uh, sort of this number heading into Q4 and Q1. And same question with uh, related to the price costs. I think the number you mentioned was 140 basis points. Thanks. 
We hebben zo tegen de prijskosten en Erik en tegen de uh, MFP. Ik denk de prijskost, we zijn definitief meer optimistisch en uh, positief today dan uh, after Q2 en after Q1. Want uh, previous we said that uh, yeah, towards Q4 we would uh, you know, see a, a more neutral situ situation. As, as uh, material prices have you know, stabilized, as you know, still initially went down and, and then stabilized, and, and also the other materials are on a, on, a, on a good level, and we were able to continue to uh, increase our prices. We are now very confident that also Q4 will still give us a very good uh, accretion price uh, versus cost. It was probably not any longer on the same level as in Q3, but still on a very good uh, level. I think the same still should be true in Q1. Uh, then going further into Q2, Q2, Q3, it's more difficult to say because we don't know what will happen with material indexes. And you know that there is a six months lag between material indexes going up or down and us seeing it in the income statement. And we also don't know yet how, how successful we will be with uh, the implementation of the price increases that we have as an ambition in the different uh, markets. But definitely Q4 and Q1 will still be uh, yeah, better and more creative than initially or, or previously said. And, and for the MFP, you could calculate with, let's say, about 100 million sec in Q4, and then we will come in Q1 next year, we will come with the next program, the MFP 10. So then, of course, we're going to generate synergies then for 2025 coming out of that program. Thank you. Thank you. Well, it's time for us now to round up this conference. Um, <clears throat> if there are any follow-up questions, feel welcome to reach out to Isabel or myself at Investor Relations. And with that, it remains only for us to thank you for your interest and participation. And we look forward to speaking and seeing many of you in the coming weeks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.